and I call Justin McNulty to ask the first question. Mr McNulty. Question number one. Minister. Gormir Ogget, Con Collier. I am thank you the member for his question. I recognise that the latest health regulations which came into operation on the 16th of October have had a significant impact across all sports at a time when they are already facing significant challenges. So I understand that sports governing bodies and their clubs find themselves facing serious financial pressures and now have to contend with the latest set of restrictions which have had an, an impact. When I met with senior representatives from governing bodies and sporting organisations last week, I recognised both the need for new restrictions to curb the escalating transmission rates and the impact it has on sport. So, as a result, I made a bid to the executive for, for a significant financial package. I was able, which was immediately supported, and I was able to announce last week that the bid was approved by the executive and as part of the October monitoring round. And work has started putting together a scheme, a scheme to ensure that the 15 million that I have secured is distributed quickly across the sector to sustain the government, sustain the government bodies and their clubs. Just make note of the Thank you, Minister, for answering this far. In the context, Minister, of the financial hardship being experienced by GEA clubs across this island, does the Minister think it would be unfair and inappropriate to ask the GEA to pay more than their legal obligation of £15 million towards Casement Park and to have done so on a television programme? Was that a party position? Was that an agreed executive position? Or was that a solo run? Well, the members should know that um, any funding arrangement with uh, this depart my department and the GAA it will be an ongoing discussion. Um, it's not the first time that that has been said in public, so I'm surprised that the members are surprised. Uh, but I, I want to assure him, and indeed other members right across uh, the GAA family, that Casey Park will be built. It took an awful long time for planning to come through, and it has been awarded. And I hope that it does succeed to the passage where I can now present a final business case to my executive colleagues, but namely the Minister for Finance. We get all the money that we need to deliver Case Home Park because it is unacceptable that Gaelic Games do not have a home that is fit for purpose for the 21st century. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, while I welcome the sporting packages that have been provided to clubs, uh, and now that planning permission has been approved for Casement Park, attention now rightly turns to funding. And with £33 million shortfall, I am delighted to see that the Minister has accepted the reality that uh, additional contributions must come from the GAA to fulfil this commitment. Can the Minister please outline the level of discussion she has had with the GAA and the potential funding uh, allocation that she would require to help this pro uh, progress uh, this stadium? Well, the bulk of the money will come from this executive. So it's just to give that member that assurance. Uh, the GAA and indeed the redevelopment of Casement Park was held back for a number of reasons, mainly planning. Uh, there is a massive shortfall. We don't know what that is yet, uh, but we need to meet that shortfall. And in order for our executive to meet that shortfall, I need to bring those proposals forward. So they are being discussed and developed and worked on as we speak. Oh, Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister uh, what evidence is being considered by her department and the Executive regards the impact of grassroots youth sports on the transmission of COVID-19? Well, I, I will be having... Um, I've asked for an update from Sport NI on this. Uh, even just when I was speaking to the governing bodies um, last week, and there was over 70 of them, and obviously it wasn't a, 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 almost a detailed discussion as such, but it's quite clear that our sporting bodies and our governing bodies are doing everything they can to ensure that young people can play and train safely, but as well as that, uh, to make sure that if it means that we need to bring in further supports for those bodies to allow that training within a safe environment to happen, that's what, we'd, that's what we're doing. And that's part of the £15 million uh, investment into sports clubs. But certainly, I uh, have asked for something similar. I'll include his question on the list to Sport and I'll bring it back to him. Moving on to call Pat Cadney. Uh, question number two, please. Thank the member for his question. Um, 
So, in line with the commitment set out in the new decade new approach deal, I can confirm that I intend to introduce new primary legislation <coughs> that will allow for an extension of welfare mitigation payments to those people affected by bedroom tax. A draft bill on this matter has been shared with executive colleagues, and it remains my intention to secure the agreed the secure agreement to proceed with this as soon as possible. New regulations to extend other mitigation schemes have been prepared, and I would hope to bring those uh, before the Assembly shortly after the Bill is introduced. I would also like to use this opportunity to highlight that mitigation payments do continue to be made to those who are eligible under the sole authority of the Budget No. 2 Act, as agreed with the Department for Finance. These contingency arrangements are, arrangements are kept under review, and I can extend them if required. Thank you, Minister, uh, for your answer and to try and uh, help as best as we possibly can our constituency offices. The Minister indicated at a hearing with the Committee for Communities on the 30th of September that dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic was and has been understandably meant other policy areas have received less attention. However, I hope the Minister recognises that the 89,000 additional claims for universal credit are largely uh, related to the pandemic, and getting these new mitigations agreed and legislated for should be the priority for this executive, hopefully before Christmas. Well, I thank the member for his question, but just to give him an update, um, my department is recruiting hundreds of staff as we speak to um, support the people, to support the already increase that we've seen, and that's before the end of the furlough scheme, even before it was due to be extended. It's, it's always been, it's not that this proposal hasn't received attention of the street, but there are other things, you know, so it's taken us quite some time even to bring forward the housing statement. But this is one of these issues that we deal with on a daily basis, and I just want to give the member that assurance. Call Pashi Hinn. Uh, could the Minister uh, advise if the new mitigations legislation will provide much needed protections for those who lost out as a result of moving to universal credit? Um, so the new legislation um, will uh, also look at the complete welfare mitigation schemes and it will include changes to the so called bedroom tax. I am currently looking at the benefit mitigation schemes. Um, the benefit cap mitigation schemes were currently available um, uh, to people in universal credit. Um, I'm also looking at the additional uh, uh, investment into the contingency fund, and as well as that, I have added more money into the discretionary payment fund too. There was a lot of talk around the, the British government's COVID isolation scheme. We've already had that here. Dirty Heart, you brought it in in March. All like the British government's one, it's not limited to £250 a week. And it's not time bound either. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, could I ask the minister if her mitigations um, will include payments or give back people access to a fast track access to PIP um, in advance of DWP taking that forward at Westminster? Well, I'm that, um, particularly given the debate that we had on the special rules in the terminal illness. So I'm looking at that for that. I'm also, and you, as you know, once you go on to SRTI, you get fast tracked anyway. But certainly, uh, dear D. Harkey introduced that she, her intention was to bring uh, Pip and Capita in the DFC, and the outcome for that will be, hopefully, it will be a completely seamless process because anybody relying on these benefits are already vulnerable, and they need our support. And what they don't need us, as a government, as administrations, is putting them through additional hoops. That sets them back. No one wants that. So I'm currently looking what I can do. Moving on, I call Emma Rogan. Can I ask um, the Minister for an update on the abolition of the conversion therapies? Um, so um, thank you for the question. So the so called conversion therapy is, as I've said before, abhorrent and it's an inhumane practice. And it aims to change a person's uh, sexual orientation or their gender identity. It is widely opposed by many, including United Nations, human rights experts, health professionals, on the basis that it is, as it, in their words, a form of torture. In September of this year, I met, a lo I met with Minister Long and Minister Swan to share my commitment to ensure these harmful practices stop. 
And as this is a cross-cut matter, it will be taken forward in the development of our uh, sexual orientation strategy that was outlined in the NDNA. I also announced a timetable for developing the social inclusion strategies. Um, and in support of these strategies, my officials have met with Government Equalities Office officers in October to discuss, how, discuss the data and what available uh, therapies um, or what available conversion therapies are in progress at the minute and indeed to discuss the date and timescales for their ban. Emma Rogan, supplementary. Um, can I also just ask the Minister, um, you alluded to it there in your, your last answer, but can you provide an update um, on the development of the sexual ori orientation strategy? Well, the, the, the sexual orientation strategy, along with the rest of the strategies, will be um, for publication in December 2021, subject to executive approval. Um, I have to say that I have been really heartened and energised by the commitment of people in the sector who are going to be engaged with my department officials and indeed others, and they will bring forward these strategies, and then I will consider them uh, before presenting them to my colleagues. But I do believe uh, I am not waiting on this strategy to ban conversion therapy. What I am trying to do is look to see what I can do in the interim, look to other legislators and, and other development institutions and other governments to see what they have done, and try and bring that forward as soon as possible. Call Colin McGrath. Much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, could I ask, has the Minister had any discussion with the Charities Commission about the charitable status um, of certain char registered charities in Northern Ireland that both support and even offer um, conversion therapy? And if she hasn't had uh, any discussions with the Charity Commission about this, would she undertake to do that? Um, well, thank you for the question. I haven't had any discussion with the Charities Commission, and I certainly will do it. And if the member has examples of charities that do this, I would very much receive those because this needs to end. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number four. Thank the member for his question. Um, so I have met with people across the local music industry, and I understand the impact of the current the restrictions are having on those who are trying to make their living through music. So this is why I was pleased to use the first three million pounds of the £29 million funding package to build up a pot uh, for the individuals on an emergency resilience programme operated by the Arts Council on my behalf. I also want to acknowledge the, future, or the financial contribution made to the fund by Future Screen NI. Uh, the fund means that the programme could make grants of up to £3.85 million to 1,089 people. Uh, whose creativity, their effort, their hard work made such a big contribution to our lives here and indeed to the economy. I know that the best support for local musicians will be a return to local live music, and I'm looking forward to getting back to live gigs myself as soon as possible. Robbie Butler, supplementary. Thank the Minister for answer, and I do thank her uh, also for the scheme that was forthcoming. Um, uh, it was timely, um, and you're quite right. We all look forward to getting back to, to listen to those artists and musicians again. Would the, would the uh, minister agree with me and make an undertaking to um, just to, to forward proof this, to consider that in the event of further lockdowns, that the scheme will be readily available, uh, that money will be found, and also um, with the lessons learned from, from other departments here, that there will be nobody excluded from the scheme, and if there is, that we can find methods of uh, filling those, those gaps. Will know that a lot of the individuals who applied for this grant had no access to public funds anywhere else. Um, and the £3 million was actually just to cover the over subscription of the previous monies announced by my department and operated through the Arts Council. I'm also waiting to see what you know, uh, you know, the outcome of the, the latest application is to see where the gaps are. Um, if they aren't already covered in that fund, I have held back a few million quid to try and help people. I hope that the restrictions that we're currently in work. We all do. I also hope that when we go back, uh, that will be in a phased return, so we're not back here again. And the people who make their living out of music are free to do so, but they do need our support, and I'm committed to try and do what I can. Well, Chris Little. Speaker, the Department for Communities Individual Emergency Resilient Programme uh, requires musicians to use this aid on a project basis rather than as income replacement to account for all profit, and the Department reserves the right to retrieve all or part of the aid on this basis. 
How does this approach compare with other executive grant aid for other employees, and is it fair to place these conditions on musicians that have lost all sources of income as a result of COVID-19? Well, to be frank, other departments are having to look at their governance arrangements as we speak, so I'm not going to be in that position. Um, a lot of our musicians are actually working and volunteering within our communities. They're working with schools. They're actually re-diversifying themselves, uh, and I want to make sure they're supported and awarded for doing that. The only criteria that they have to do, really, is to prove that they're involved in the arts, and they also have bank accounts, and they will be monitoring and evaluation by the Arts Council. And I don't want to impose any further restrictions. It is ridiculous, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but for a bigger group receiving millions of pounds, they should, the smaller groups who are receiving a few thousand quid should not be subject to the same regulation as those in receipt of millions of pounds over a period of decades. Call Caramel. Thank you, Minister, and uh, for your answer so far. And thank you for engaging with the musicians. I know um, in my own area that they're very appreciative of the grant that they've got. Minister, can I ask you what the remainder of the 26 million will be spent on? Thank you. So we're currently looking, so thank the member for her supplementary, we're currently looking um, at the Arts Council here opening applications and certainly we're looking at um, some of our theatres, our galleries, our museums, our libraries, our heritage sites, our languages, our culture, our heritage, uh, to try and make uh, interventions here because everyone has been impacted financially by COVID and certainly COVID restrictions. They all need our support. They're all viable businesses, their viable products, they're, and they provide a viable events. And some have received public money throughout the years, but they haven't had the ability to have a ticket uh, or generate their own income through their own uh, events. And we need to make sure that they're viable coming out the other end of this. Um, in terms of uh, our libraries and our museums, um, and indeed our heritage products, they too need our support as well. Uh, there won't be enough money to grow in everyone. I'm very conscious of that, but we need to try and get emergency support into people, not only to ensure they're viable now and they retain the staff and the skills they have now, but hopefully viable at the other end of this. Well, Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I also thank the Minister for answers so far? Minister, you'll be aware that many of those musicians had a short window after, the, after lockdown where they were back playing in our pubs and clubs, and we're doing so in a very safe safe manner behind perspex screens and everything else it puts safety um, first and foremost but then that was very quickly taken away from them um, very quickly into that um, so they lost their income way before the hospitality uh, uh, industry lost their income so it's just to ask whenever we do reopen our, our bars and our restaurants again will you be fighting for them at the executive to allow them to get back to work because that's what they want to do they want to get back to work not receive handouts from from the various ministries I absolutely will. Um, so these people who give us entertainment when we're out for a drink or getting a meal are also taxpayers and repairs as well, and people need to remember that. There's more restrictions put on some of the people than what some of the smaller people, what their husband and big businesses, and it's not fair. I want to mention the DJs because DJs felt that they were left out. Can I assure you that these aren't? Um, these aren't being left out. The difficulty is, and it's shown me that not many people were aware of what was available to the Arts Council, and we need to change that. Um, so it's just to give them that assurance because they too are, are trying to make a living and because of the public restrictions that we've put on people it stopped them making a living so as soon as it's safe to do so we need to ensure that their return and indeed return of musicians to their livelihoods and indeed to the hospitality sector is done the way it was it's done in a safe way um, and hopefully people uh, will recognise that and appreciate that well, Mark Durgan I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers and indeed her actions uh, thus far. But could the Minister detail what support is available or will be available to non musicians employed within the music industry, your uh, sound technicians, event organisers, etc.? The member will be aware that the original uh, short grants uh, programme that, that I put through the Arts Council was oversubscribed. So £3 million, not £29 million, went straight to look after the oversubscription. 
Um, the, the level of oversubscription was just below £3 million to allow a few more others to try and get supported. I have no doubt, because you just heard me answering Paula Bradley, DJs, there's only 20 DJs, and there's, like, there's 20 DJs in the new lodge, never mind across the north. So very proud of our local DJs, but all I'm saying is that we need to try and give those people support too, because their livelihoods have been impacted. So I want to see what people have done with this app, latest funding application in Arts Council, and if there are, continues to be gaps, particularly for our freelancers, our sound engineers, our technicians who rely on events, then we need to look after them, and that's my commitment. I call Liz Kimmins. Thank the member for her question. I have made the commitment that citizen and community engagement, co-design and co-production will be embedded from the outset of the development of an anti-poverty strategy. So I want to assure the member that the anti-poverty strategy is evidence-based, it takes account of lived experience and meaningfully tackles inequalities and obstacles that directly affect the everyday lives of people as a result of living in poverty. So to that end, I have appointed an expert panel to make recommendations on the key themes and priorities that the strategy should address. And these recommendations will inform the work of a co-design group made up of cross-section of community and voluntary sectors, uh, neighbourhood renewal partnerships uh, and others. And this co-design group will be pivotal in shaping the development and the content of the strategy and its support and action plan. And the publication of this consultation will hopefully and should be by December 2021. Ms. supplementary. I would like to thank the Minister for her answer. Um, the announcement of the development of an anti-poverty strategy is very welcome. and I know the great work that the neighbourhood renewal uh, groups do, and that, particularly in my own area in Newry, we've got nine groups there, and it's really, really good to hear that they're, they're going to be a key part of that. Can the Minister therefore provide an update on, on our plans to deal with the long-term future of neighbourhood renewal? So, um, like the member, I think there's lots of members who have neighbourhood renewal groups or groups that work in areas at risk right across their constituencies. And just to put it on record again, the work that those groups did at the start of the pandemic was sec you know, second to none. They were the first responders. Uh, so we need to ensure that not only is that work recognised, it's valued, but as part of an anti-poverty strategy, which neighbourhood renewal was some 15, 20 years ago, we need to ensure that the work of neighbourhood renewal groups is seen in a new anti-poverty strategy, so they're working towards targets that are actually more realistic than the ones they're trying to work through, which are at least 15 years old. I call the Lord's Kelly. Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister. I'm just confirming that it's November 21. You hope to publish the final strategy. And in what uh, way will the working poor be taken account of? Uh, I think there's more and more people fall into that bracket with the lower wage economy we have and also the zero hour contracts. Um, Dolores, just in case I've said this, if I said November was wrong, it's December. It's December 2021. You're 100% right. And you were here earlier on when we are talking about working poor in terms of housing. So we need intermediate actions because low wages, a lot of them, even in our hospitality and tourist sector, are relying on zero hours contracts, which I don't support at all. So what we need to do is to make sure that as part of anti-poverty, we look at where people are. So it's relative to their financial status of where they're at. So low to medium and low income families have been with us for too long. So we need to have them reflected and included in terms of outcomes as a part of this strategy. Well, Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, the work of neighbourhood renewal projects is to be celebrated, but one of the areas of the anti poverty strategy that can't be forgotten about is rural areas that don't have neighbourhood renewal projects. I was just wondering, you've already given money or have worked with the, with the DERA Minister um, on rural projects. Was, is there any update on how that will be included in the anti poverty strategy? We're looking at, you'll be aware of Tripsy, you'll be aware of the rural development needs. Act would be rural proofing. That ha so this isn't just an urban experience. This has to be for all citizens. And the question was about, you know, neighbourhood renewal projects, but it's it's right across the piece. Um, in fact, if you look even at the way in which people haven't been able to access support unless their local uh, community helped them out, then their experience of poverty and isolation would be, would be much greater. And we need to ensure that this is rural proofed. I call uh, Paul Fruit. 
Brennan, alluding to some of the questions already asked about people just managing or people with poor incomes, there, there are certainly areas, specific areas of deprived areas within affluent areas that have not been able to avail of any of this money. And is the Minister sure that the super output areas or the geographical spread and definition of these areas is the correct one going forward? Well, I tell you what's not correct. So we're not doing one for you and one for me because it's in your constituents' mind. So we're not doing equity, we're doing equality. And that's really important. And wherever people experience poverty and however they experience it, we need to take that into consideration. I do recognise that there are pockets of depraved communities within what would be seen as an affluent area. Christopher Stafford's not here, South Belfast is an example of it. But the issue for us is that unless we capture those people and ensure that they're part of an anti-poverty strategy, not only are they going to feel resentful, but their experience of poverty is going to increase. And we need to work with people where they're at. So I think it's important, not just neighbourhood renewal partnerships, but also any partnership or community structure or consortium that they're involved in respond to this strategy when it goes out for publication, because we, we don't want to leave anybody behind. I call Trevor Lund. Question number six, Minister. I've lost my burns, Trevor. Hold on. Thank you. Um, so the Housing Amendment Act received royal assent on the 20th of August 2020. This Act will end the house sale schemes for housing association after a transition period of two years. The transition period will enable the current housing association tenants who meet the eligibility criteria to purchase their homes. I intend um, to bring forward, as part of the statement I made today, set out uh, the matter for the housing executive house sale schemes also, um, and using the same lead-in period uh, for them as well, so that people who have applications in can have those processed. Supplementary, Trevor Lund. Yes, I uh, thank the Minister for that. Um, th th that question was actually put back from a previous session when the Minister couldn't attend, and she did spend an hour this morning virtually answering that question. So, um, thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to give her a bow ball on this and just sit down again. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Mr. Lund. Okay, I call C Colm Gillernoe. And thank you, Minister. And can I just ask, by way of supplementary, um, what other options the Minister is considering to assist tenants into home ownership? Um, well, I thank the member for a supplementary. Um, so this morning, uh, um, I think that, uh, I'm sure the member was in the chamber, but certainly looking at ways to make co-ownership, if that's uh, someone's choice, to make it more accessible, because at the minute. Um, it's not as affordable as we all originally thought it would be. Some people are being asked to pay up to £12,000, six months' rent in advance in order to access um, a home um, for home ownership, and that's, that's not acceptable. Um, despite that, uh, there have been good opportunities to co ownership for almost 1,000 people a year to buy their own home. But we need to, in my opinion, we just need to look at additional options for people who can't afford to pay that much money up front. I call Rachel Wood. Speaker, and I appreciate that the Minister had um, answered a number of questions on her statement this morning in relation, so I'll be cheeky and get another one that I wanted to ask in this morning with regard to the splitting of the landlord function of the housing executive, um, which would mean that it would have a freedom to borrow and invest. But how would this be facilitated without raising the rents? Well, the rents are capped at the minute under Westminster legislation, and our executive has agreed to that. And even in NDNA, we've also agreed to the way in which we need to ensure not only are the rents affordable, but that we, as was outlined in my statement today, that the rents that were particularly under housing executive are the lowest, some of the lowest in these islands. Um, but it is really important that whatever powers or designation we give, we're doing it on the basis of conditionality, that to do the right thing, that there's more of an increase in social housing, there's better outcomes for people who are living in housing stress, because at the end of the day, that's, that's at the, the bottom of all this, and that's what it's about. And that ends the period for a list of questions. Uh, we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Jonathan Buckley. Topical question eight has been withdrawn. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, I welcome your warm words of support for the Northern Ireland football's team 
Euro playoff final next week against Slovakia and the much needed morale boost that it can bring to the country in bleak times. Would the Minister commit to working with Belfast City Council, the IFA, Supporters Association and indeed executive colleagues to ensure we can have the maximum number of fans safely attend our national stadium at Windsor Park to cheer on our wee country? So, um, I have spoken to the IFA. Um, I am waiting on Belfast City Council because they are the licensing authority. I, I want to make this game as stress-free as possible, not only for the team but for all their supporters. Um, so I will do what I can to ensure the maximum amount of supporters under the current restrictions are able to go to Windsor Park. Jonathan Buckley, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her response. And, and we know that the stadium has a capacity of 18,000, and with it being outdoors and considerable space for social distancing, could the Minister potentially elaborate on what sort of numbers are under consideration at present? Well, I'm well aware of what Windsor Park has, because I, I built it. So, um, so the, the, the issue for me is I don't want to get into speculation because I want to respect the IFA and I want to respect Belfast City Council and indeed their work with Sport and my department. But just to give the member assurance, we want the game to be as stress-free as possible and to have a number of spectators there within safe social distancing and within the guidelines. And I will do what I can to make that happen for them. So Neil Bradley, not in her place, I move on to Jerry Kelly. John Collyogos, my who then Ira Lahan Jack Talk, the Armagen. I thank the, the Minister for her uh, statement this morning, which uh, I think pleased almost everybody. Um, in, t- in terms of what she was saying this morning, and, and she knows that in North Belfast the housing stress is uh, there's a huge uh, housing stress. What interventions uh, does she think she, she will be using to reduce uh, the huge uh, numbers that are there? Thank the member for his question, and he, he, he will have seen that in the statement we're bringing back. We're going to bring back the uh, introduction of ring fencing for uh, North Belfast, West Belfast, and, and, and indeed Derry City, simply because it's the three most persistent areas with the highest demand um, and the most and a growing and increasing. Uh, numbers of families and people on the housing waiting list and living in acute housing stress. So, uh, I, as I said this morning, my officials are wor- working with the housing executive to bring forward a scheme to have the ring fence and reintroduced as soon as possible. Jerry Kelly, supplementary. Uh, going back to the session, I hand for Agri I thank the Minister for the answer up to now. She may have uh, answered what I was going to ask, which is. Will the, uh, the housing executive, or sorry, will the minister and the department lead in terms of uh, ring fencing to meet objective need? And may I just add to that, in the issue of vesting, um, which I think is a part within the housing executive, but is seldom used. There are times when it really does need to be used, especially in terms of uh, land banking. And that, there, if she has a comment on that. Um, yeah, certainly, we we are looking at everything. Um, I think one of the, at least at least one of the members asked this morning about land availability because that's been one of the biggest, if not the biggest, obstacle next to budget uh, for housing executive, but particularly housing associations in the latter years to build homes, and indeed the availability of land in areas to highest demand. So my ambition would be that not only ring fence and looks at numbers, but we also look at way in which we can deliver upon the numbers of people who are living in housing stress. And I call George Robinson. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the Minister will be glad to hear that of another football question. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, can the Minister confirm if her department <coughs> will provide financial support to Irish League football clubs such as Coleraine, Limavady United, who, because of the pandemic, will suffer great financial hardship from fewer, fewer supporters allowed into their grounds? Well, the member will be aware that the £15 million sports hardship fund is available to all the clubs that the member mentioned in his constituency so far played in. Um, and those applications should be open fairly soon and be available to clubs on the ground. And the member's right, a lot of these clubs have been hit really, really hard since the start of this pandemic. Supplementary, so, George Robinson. Thanks again, Mr Speaker. Would the Minister agree that <clears throat> some of these clubs, because of the present virus situation, could go out of existence without government support? I do agree. And I also want to put on record 
my appreciation and thanks, and thank on behalf of us all of the work that those clubs have done on the ground from the start of this pandemic. I mean, even in my own constituency, uh, not a football club, but our down GAA, along with Community Food Bank, we're actually up to all hours in morning delivering food parcels uh, for, for kids in deprived areas. I know, again, in my constituency, um, Crusaders and Clippenville have done the same thing, and I know that's replicated right across. So I want to try and give the clubs as much support as possible. I call Keeve Archibald. Can call you, and I thank the Minister for her responses so far, and I also thank her for her statement earlier today. I think it's the start of a really important transformation in housing. Um, uh, the, mine is a sports question as well. And, um, the recent announcement on the Hardship Fund is a very welcome development, but can the Minister clarify if grassroots um, sporting clubs will be able to apply in their own right, or will it be carried out by governing bodies? Um, I thank a member for that question, and it is important because I've been asked it a few times. So, to be fair to the governing bodies, they need to apply for this in their own right, as does the grassroots groups to apply for it in their own right. I wouldn't imagine any government body wanting to take the responsibility of loads of clubs within their sector wanting to deal with applications. So, in, in response, anyone can apply, should it be a small group or a large government body, can apply to that hardship fund in their own right. Keep Archibald up. Supplementary. Um, Gormagra, can I call you? Thank the Minister for that response. Um, if we could just ask the Minister, how long does she think it will be before the money actually hits communities? Gormagra. Well, I'm, I'm getting an update from Sport NI, but I was really encouraged to hear that Antoinette McKeown made it very, very clear, the Chief Executive of Sport NI. She made it really clear that because of the nature of this fund and because the hardship groups have been within sport and families have been you know, enduring the hardship throughout this pandemic, she wants to get this fund open and available to them as soon as possible, as indeed do I. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the Minister's commitment to support uh, Northern Ireland's preparations in the, uh, for the upcoming European Championship qualification playoff final? And can I ask the Minister for an update on the sub-regional football stadia funding programme? Well, I'm also looking at the final business case for the uh, sub-regional football programme as well. Um, it's been a long time in the, in the making. I know there have been variations of consultations and plans that have been reworked and amended, um, but the final business case will hopefully be completed in coming months. Um, and that's, that's what I hope to do, get that announced as soon as I get everything else sorted. Uh, Chris Nettle, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for her update. Can I ask the Minister if, if she will seek to increase the budget for the sub-regional football stadia fund in line with any increase to the regional stadia fund? And can I also ask the Minister if she can give her assurance that the sub-regional football stadia funding will be allocated to clubs before the end of this Assembly mandate? Well, I just want to make something really clear. Because Caseham Park has overrun and cost, doesn't mean to say that whatever overrun has been that that's going to transfer over to sub-regional. That's completely unrealistic. But does the sub-regional fund need more money? It, it absolutely does. So when the final business case is done, I will see what money I have left to allocate from that fund and any potential for any additional on top of that as well. I call it Rachel Woods. Mr Speaker, um, the Minister will be aware of the negative impact that the pandemic has had on the maintenance of social housing and the urgent need to address this. It is my understanding that roughly £450 million worth of maintenance contracts have been awarded by the Housing Executive, with a further £90 million to tender over the next 12 months. So, Can the Minister confirm exactly how much maintenance contracts have been awarded this financial year? Well, certainly, the, I mean, I'll get the exact figure because it has changed, and I'll tell you why it's changed. We well, mentioned this earlier. There have been procurement challenges in areas uh, that have put back the uh, maintenance contracts going ahead, and the threshold for challenging procurement contracts is so low that anyone with 250 quid can go into a court to object to millions of pounds of a procurement to alleviate some of the worst conditions that people are living in. And frankly, I think that's a disgrace. Um, so I will get the member the exact figure. The Housing Executive have also brought forward a pilot scheme in its southern region, which actually brought the procurement down by 40 odd weeks. So I'm willing to learn lessons from that and bring it forward. And certainly the last reason, and I know the member knows this, but I think because of the restrictions on just emergency repairs actually put a dent um, or has created a wider gap really 
in the, the maintenance programme, but certainly I'll get a response to her because I'm keen to find out exactly what the figure is myself. Rachel, we supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for her answer. In light of the severe levels of condensation and rising damp that pose a health risk to many housing executive tenants, mostly um, specifically an issue in my constituency, can the Minister confirm whether any contracts currently out for tender include urgent work on ventilation and the installation of replacement damp proof courses, and specifically for Northern Ireland housing executive tenants in North Down? I get the member that um, information and those details. Unfairly, a lot of families are being reared in houses, and some of those families have been impacted by respiratory conditions as a result of the conditions they're living in, and that's a disgrace. Uh, and I know the housing executive are completely uncomfortable with that as well, so I will get the details of the information she's asked. The members asking the questions nine and time are not in their seats. That therefore brings an end to this particular question time. So thank you, and could ask members to uh, take a raise for a moment or two. Thank you.